Um, he also created the inter interstate highway system. Um, he did do civil rights legislation supporting that, black voters. So, so both but, of those, both of those are very American things, aren't they? What civil rights the and the American highway system? Yeah, yeah, and we treat both of them about the same now. Um, underfunded and not maintained very well. <laughs> All right, welcome to Dad Bod History. Um, I'm Eric. I'm Jake. And we have a guest, Cameron, with us today. Um, it's been really difficult to book him with his agent, but here he is. Um, it took all of five minutes last night well, to get him on. So <laughs> Yeah, and, and here's the <clears throat> thing is, um, you know, we did some focus testing, focus groups, and they said we need to expand our, our market and our, our viewership. And so, so we said... The, well, let's the get six, the tallest person six, we know. Six seven to six ten range. Yeah, that was going to do it. For yeah, us. we were really lacking in that market, so <laughs> we've literally found the tallest person we know. We don't even know him well. It's called diversity, uh, he, folks. I saw him at a, I saw him at Costco <laughs> a couple weeks ago. So, um, this is Cameron Lehman. Everybody, woo! Yes, and I'm I'm. Uh, no, no, you know. uh, we didn't ask you to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. All wow. right, go ahead. This is going to be a long podcast. I, no, I just um, confirmed our second guest, by the way. We just need a day. I'm, I'm realizing my lifelong uh, dream of joining two of my best friends talking about um, nerdy dad history. So I've, I've mm -hmm. had this dream for over 24 hours now. So this is pretty, pretty and, exciting. And, and those are the best dreams, really. Mm -hmm. The ones that happen to you suddenly without warning. Um. And for all of you that are watching, and if you don't know this, Cameron is a very qualified father, uh, at least 50% more qualified than I am. He has two, he has three lovely children, whereas I only have two. Exactly um, as qualified as I am. He's exa yes, nobody's better than Eric. We get it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just right. just want to make so, sure that's uh, recorded. Okay. No, definitely. You're going to play that over and over again, aren't that's you? That's going to be the <laughs> clip we put on Instagram. That's going to put it on loop. Hey. So speaking of being a dad, um, Cameron, what'd you do this Father's Day today? Um, Did you guys do anything? Not really. We're going to go to a barbecue later and go swimming and all that kind of thing. Um, my three-year-old is not yet water safe, which is rare in the layman house. You know, we, we're swimmers and all that, but mm -hmm. she's getting there. Um, but okay. speaking of fatherhood and all that, I got a quick story to tell. So Nora is three. She's our youngest, and she's definitely the the loudest layman child to date yeah and you know just will cry at the drop of a hat and not really for a reason just crying to cry and finally april asked her april my wife asked her the other day why are you crying and she earnestly looked april back in the eye and said i like crying <laughs> so okay <laughs> that's you know, her thing yeah yeah I, I guess that's her thing so cool gotta How like something you, right I, I don't even know. You didn't do anything today? Nothing? Your parent, your wife and kids didn't even acknowledge we just, that it was Father's Day? We've just been chilling all day so far, nice. which is kind of nice. Pretty nice, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to get all, like, big party or, or anything. We'll, we'll cook out tonight, have something good. Mm -hmm. So we just have to decide what. Throw some meat on the grill and... That'll be it. Sounds we'll good. Go this is a part. This is a part where we do a, an ad for Traeger Grills, right? Like no, oh yeah, they're say a no, this segment no. has a, oh, Listen, if they're not giving us money, I'm not well, saying the name on it. No, but I almost no, bought a Traeger, Traeger at Costco. They wouldn't the other license day. to us. They wouldn't license to us, so we had to go with Blager Blager Grills. <laughs> it's uh, just as good. Half the price. Good. The, pellet, the pellets are, are actually sawdust. They're not even pellets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mostly the glue from so, the wood. Blager grills. Blager or Lager? Hmm? Blager or Lager? Yeah, no. No, they're both they oh. both works. Yeah. <laughs> um, they Blager is a subdivision shiny... of uh <laughs> They patented every single thing that kind of sounds like Traeger. Yeah. And so they they've got the whole market That's except good. for Traeger. Yeah. That's good. I almost got convinced to upgrade my Traeger at Costco the other day. I was so close. Mm. Mm. Then I was like, I don't, I can't actually buy this. Like I could get to the register with this and that's as far as I'd get. So <laughs> I was really tempted. Yeah. 
you know, I say the first step's the hardest, but paying for it probably is the hardest yeah, step. Yeah, so. it, would be, it would have been worth it, though. I should have just tried to steal it and just claim I was looting. It. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. What about awesome. you, Jake? All right, well, uh, well, we didn't do anything, but uh, when I came downstairs, uh, my wife had this lovely poster framed um, for me. It's a timeline of world history, so all these different civilizations and kind of in case you get start, stuck during the podcast, you can just turn case around. case I and... forget, which, well, we know happens a lot. I mean, so it's good that I have a, a cheat sheet back here now. That, that's so good. It sounds so stupid. But, uh, yeah, I got that. Uh, Langston and Marcus both gave me a uh, Father's Day card, and then there's three giant bags of beef jerky for me. So, all in all, a, a good Father's Day. Very nice. All right. So... Moving on, what are we talking about today, Eric? Okay, so we have a... So I want to kind of get into my tirade first. Because I think that's a good lead-in. So here it is. Here's the problem with the United States. Here's the problem with America. Good. It's also one of the greatest things about America. is that we are obstinate. Our whole system was designed to slow down progress. Because progress can be very dangerous. Like if it happens too quickly then bad things can happen. Um, Mm -hmm. If we don't think about an issue enough and we just implement it, serious problems can occur. And so that's why a lot of major laws take a long time because our system is set up to prevent very swift change. So when New Zealand goes ahead and they they ban all assault rifles, whatever that means, um, our system would bog that down because we would have to have the discussion about what are the the trade-offs with the benefits, what are the consequences, both intended and unintended. The problem is there's certain things in this country um, that are not, that aren't, well, I wouldn't say aren't trivial, but that are not so major that we also have a tendency to just not want to touch. And it doesn't make sense that we don't want to touch them. Everyone sees a good reason why we should maybe adjust something but it just can't happen because those who have the ability to make laws just refuse. Um, and so this topic, which we're going to stretch out over hopefully a dozen or so episodes, um, is about U.S. currency. And in the current climate over the past two weeks, we've seen a bunch of statues torn down. This has nothing to do with that, mostly. Um you know, the goal is not to just tear these people off of these dollar bills because they may have owned a slave or two or 300 at one time. The goal is to look at who would we put on these uh, one, two, five, 10, 20, 50, and $100 bills um, who might also be deserving of it. And so today, in this episode, we are going to rebill the uh, major paper denominations with new people. Now, in this case, what are our rules for this or what? So the rules are, um, there's seven denominations, one, two, five, 10, 20, 50, and 100. We're not doing the 500 or $1,000 bill. Um, we're also not doing any coinage. Um, so we have seven names that we're going to potentially replace. Um, the rules that we arbitrarily set up are you can keep two, up to two of them if you want. Um, and you have to have an either a former U.S. president of which there's five U.S. presidents currently uh, on the bills, or um, you can have two non-presidents, but they have to have had been involved in high-level federal government um, right. for a period of time in their right. life. They can't just be... Uh, uh, and it's not that we won't do this episode, but as much as I would love to see Martin Luther King on some currency, since he never served in the United States government, he doesn't fit the rules for of this, this particular episode. version. Right. Which is why we want to do more because it's kind of a fun rabbit yeah. hole to run down is, well, yeah. what if we did it with civil rights leaders or what if we did it with famous um, scientists or explorers? Yeah. And, and so it kind of gives so, us, that way we can have themes. One of the, uh, one of the impetuses of, impeti of this is there's been a move to remove uh, Andrew Jackson um, from, what, the $20 bill. And they've looked at, well, who could we replace him with? Because Andrew Jackson problematically had a lot of negative impact on Native Americans and Aboriginal peoples in the United States. Uh, and that's fine. I'm not really interested in the reason why you want to remove somebody unless I can come up with... 
a solid reason. I'm like, yeah, go ahead and remove them. Um, because I'd be okay with remove them because, uh, you know, we've had that money for more than, you know, a year. Um, but they've toyed with the idea of putting Harriet Tubman on there. And I, I'm totally fine with that idea. The other one was Frederick Douglass, and I think both of those are fine ideas. But I've seen some of the imagery trotted out for Harriet Tubman, and it's just, it's a portrait of her later in life, which is fine, but that's it. That's it. It's just fine. Uh, I'd ra- there's there's the other image I've seen that's more doctor where she's got the pistol and she's got her hand out. It's like she's saying, "Come with yeah. me if you want to live," and yeah. I think that's better because it gives anyone handling the money well, just a story to say what's going on here. Now, if you see some mm-hmm. old lady on your dollar bill, you just say, "Well, okay, that's Harriet Tubman." Well, what'd she do? Well, she you know fought for slaves. If you have a picture of her with a pistol hand, you know, stretching out her hand, it becomes, she's in action. This is what she did. This is why she matters. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think that would be more interesting because I think there's an opportunity on our U.S. currency to tell a story, to inform our population, our citizens of the history of this nation, both good and bad. Uh, I I would say, like, flip the the money over and get rid of the, uh, the monuments and put some, like, text on there like here's this president here's something he did and have like a series of 20 different one dollar bills that all tell about this particular person um that would be interesting to me but yeah i digress and and it's funny that the way you're framing that because it reminds me of uh the google doodles that come out anytime a famous person did something right and yeah just click on this and you can find out about uh marie curie or whomever and uh, so it's just yeah, it'd be cool if, if there was like in a sense you're 25 you're different one dollar bills do that same thing uh, if there's 25 different one dollar bills that all had George Washington on them, but on the back they had 25 different facts about George yeah. Washington that we could we could teach and learn from. Uh, you know, if you wanted, no, that'd be awesome. If you wanted to collect all the 25 one hundred dollar bills. I mean, it cost you a bit, but you could have all the well, facts. Well, 25 dollars. I mean, that's, yeah, 20. Well, that's fine, know. but a hundred dollar bills. And I think that's a good point, Eric, because um, as I get older and older, I become more interested in history because what you learn in school is not necessarily the truth or not necessarily the whole piece of the puzzle and you know i go down rabbit holes on wikipedia sometimes and oh that's interesting that's interesting then next thing you know i'm better for it and and Mm -hmm. currency would be a good example of of how to do that for the populace yeah i i totally agree and i think um I'm the same exact same way. Like I'll be like, who's this person? And then three hours later, 47 Wikipedia articles and, and 16 suspect YouTube videos. I'm like, Oh, now I know. Now I know everything there is to know. And the earth is about flat. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, we're going to go through these now. I, I did a little bit of like, off research. I don't know what you want to call it. I, I, I looked at some things and, and here's some things about currency. And, and one of them is simply, um, so it looks like the most in circulation bill is a $1 bill followed closely by the $100 bill. Now the $100 bill, just cause they're in circulation, most of those hundred dollar bills are actually held, uh, offshore overseas. And it's basically just to hold value. And then there's, um, those are followed, and this stat I'm looking at, I don't have a year on this stat, I don't think. Um, Mm -hmm. It looks like, yeah, I don't have a year on it. Um, So, but this is fairly recently, like 11.9 billion, sorry, 11.7 billion $1 bills, 11.5 billion $100 bills. And the next one is the 20, and there's 8.9 billion of them. And then... The $5 bill has $2.8 billion, followed by the 10 which is $1.9 billion. The 50 there's only $1.7 billion in circulation. And then the $2 bill has $1.2 billion. So, um, I'm sorry to refute that, Eric, but every cash register job I've ever had, we ran out of fives first. So I, I don't want to fact check you or anything, <laughs> but those five dollar bills are hard to come. But they're like five dollars. Well, yeah, I don't um, think you had five, all two point eight billion at your store. I, uh, yeah, did you get? Where'd you get your numbers from, Hoffman? I, I, this is a uh, is that from uh-huh. Title Max? 
Um, sound suspect. Okay. Anyways, okay. I, I'm just yeah. coming up with stuff. The other one I looked at was from like 2004, and I'm like, that's not accurate. So the the question I have is, which bill is has the, the highest important. esteem to be on? Okay. And, and that should be our last one. And I, my, my personal opinion is that would be that would be like it would be the hundred or the twenty. I would say the 20. Okay. Because that's the one that's most used, and I think that's the one. That Here's is. how you can tell, because that's the one that gets counterfeited the most. Okay. When counterfeiters make fake money, they make the 20, which tells you that that's what the one you want to be on. I just want the Secret Service to know that Jake knew that, not me. I have no idea what is <laughs> counterfeited the Says most. the guy that's been Photoshopping currency <laughs> all week. I, okay. I didn't even I use Photoshop. I, yeah, I couldn't no. afford no, it. No, it was me. It was me. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so then let's start so with. I think I think we have the twenty go last. Then what's if that's what's the wanna. least important bill? The two. The two. Yeah, agree. The two far and away. That, is the okay, most now important. just because it's it's the one where you have to go to the bank and ask for it special. That's, that's not, true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Or you get paid by some weirdo. Two, two has the peanut allergy of money. Like it's not. <laughs> It's not really. The, the person who pays you in $2 bills is a suspect person. <laughs> Just, yeah. That, that's, 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 also, that's also reserved for grandmothers, you know, because they always pass out the $2 bills. Exactly. Or the mail or something. So I still have a $2 bill for my grandma. Yeah, so thanks, grandma. Yeah. It's no, worthless to me. It cost you $2, but <laughs> oh. I can't use it because it's too special. <laughs> <laughs> Which, okay. So, okay. So who's on so the two dollar bill? Who's on the special two? Okay. Who's on so the two dollar bill, bill currently? currently has Thomas Jefferson, and on the back side is the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Okay, that's and I and I feel like old Tommy got kind of slighted being put on the two, but maybe when he was originally put on there, people still use the two dollar bill. But I feel like that's a for for his importance in the country. It's just. Okay, it's so ironic that he, he's on he such got a, a pretty impressive monument in Washington D.C. So I'm okay with him taking a back seat on currency. Okay, okay well, that's fair. All right, so the that's two dollar bill. Um, just so you know, one of my rules that I put into place is nobody who's still alive. If you're still alive, you cannot be on my money. Well, that changes every single one of mine. Well, that's fine. That's... You can have them. Um, okay. I mean, somebody's got to love Obama, but. Listen, uh, Joe Paterno, no, not Paterno, Joe Penn State, I'm losing it. Yeah, Paterno. Paterno. He had a statue while he was still alive. Yeah. And what they have to do? They tore it down. So I I think take time to build your monuments to the Confederacy. Wait 50 years, and then 50 years later we'll tear them down. So who do you have for the $2 bill? Okay, um... So for the two dollar bill and and uh, I did this, maybe I don't know how you guys did it, but I went with Nixon, Tricky Dick, what? Tricky Dick Nixon. <laughs> and, well, what? Because you gotta, you, you need gotta a bill in the bank. You gotta, you feel kind of bad about even asking. Hey, do you guys have any two dollar bills? So I think Nixon <laughs> would be perfect hmm. for the two dollar bill. Um, he's. I, and, and it's it's a shame how everything ended for him. But he served in the Senate for a long time. He was a vice president. Then he was a president. And then he did a little hotel break in and everything went down in flames. And So, so I think do you have Nixon the Watergate was, Hotel uh, on the back of that oh. bill? Mm. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You have the Watergate Hotel on the back of that. You know, that, that would make the $2 bill the most fun bill to have. Everybody would want it too. Oh, yeah, definitely. So Nixon. are we... Like in a future episode, is that the bill that we put OJ on? (laughs) Why not? (laughs) Or like, yeah, or Steve Bartman from the Cubs. Anybody that munsoned it, anybody that totally screwed screwed up, that's who you want on the two. So that's my that's my vote for two. Um, Well, that's what about you, Cameron? Who? It's not the route I took. Or do you guys just want to? You know what? That was, that was really well me? reasoned. I, I like that. My first reaction was no way, but no, it, you justified that very well. So I'm going to go in the in the vein of unassuming, and in the vein of kind of not mentioned often. Calvin Coolidge. Um, you look at a guy okay. who 
Um, Silent Cal. And I happen to hear this stat somewhere. Maybe it's wrong. Fact check me on this. But um, he actually lessened the federal debt while president. And that blows my mind. Um, the one guy. The president that I know of that did that. Um, and you guys both know me well enough to know my affinity for staying debt free. Um, so I have a special appreciation for that. Um, well, maybe Dave Ramsey can sponsor us then. That, there you go. Yeah, Dave, <laughs> Dave, give me a call. But even at the top of this podcast, a guy, uh, uh, a guy who considers himself wise said that progress can be dangerous. And sometimes um, that restraint and saying as little as possible, because he was known as Silent Cal. He was unassuming um, both in personality and the way in which he, he governed. Um, and I think that'd be a good fit for the $2 bill. Definitely an underrated president, in my, uh, my opinion. So I think Sounds Calvin like that. Coolidge. I've always liked Calvin Coolidge. He, so. he appears on like a $10,000 note. There, there's certain notes yeah, above. Like it, right. Nobody ever. Well, maybe you so. don't. <laughs> oh, sorry, one, sorry, one percent. Hold on, let me get my wallet. Um, so, how about you, Hoff? I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with one of my reuses. Now, I have a couple reuses um, from current currency, and you know, I think about. Obviously, one of the concerns today is how we memorialize men who were who were uh, not perfect, because most of these men were not perfect. Um, Mm -hmm. and so they all have their own individual faults, their own individual sins. And I think I can be kind of sympathetic to that, but we also have to remember these men founded this nation, which while not perfect is probably the most perfect Remember, the declaration of independence was not, or the, the constitution did not say, you know, the, a perfect union, the, a more perfect union. So, um, because I think he needs to be remembered, but I think we need room for others. Um, I'm going to put George Washington on this, on the $2 bill. Uh, first president, that means something. He set a lot of precedents in terms of he didn't want to serve uh, past. He didn't want to serve a second term at all, uh, but he didn't serve it past a second term. Obviously, a war hero of the revolution. Um, you know, he was he was a, a general during that time. He also one of the precedents I didn't realize he he set that I think we would have a problem with today if it wasn't set was calling the president mis- or addressing the president, Mister President. Because they were thinking about like your highness, the president, um, you know, all these like, like high terms. And he said, no, it's just Mr. President. Just call me that. And if we didn't have that now, we'd have a problem with that today. If we hadn't had a problem in the past 200 years. Um, you know, and, and I think in many cases he was a he was a pretty humble guy. He opposed political parties. Um, and, you know, again... He, he owned slaves, but he also struggled with the idea of slavery and how that uh, didn't jive with the the Constitution, with the, the Declaration of Independence. It didn't fit, and later in life he had to deal with that, but he still owned the slaves. So uh, I know there's some pretty, like, brutal, gruesome details about how he dealt with his slaves, um, but I think looking at the whole body of work, we still need to remember this person who set the precedence for our presidency. And so I put him on the two because we, we get his story. Um, there's room to be made for others. <clears throat> you could put the cherry tree on the back, though. I mean, you could do a lot of things with with who, or his crossing the Delaware. Or, I mean, there's so many images from his life that you could, cool. if you wanted to do that series of yeah. money. See, that, that, that's uh, a whole other thing I didn't even consider. But yeah, the cherry tree crossing could, the that Delaware. That could tell the story. Um, the, the signing of the, the Declaration of Independence. Um, you know, all these things that he was at and part of. So, yeah, that's a good one. And he's also I mean, if you're, one of I mean, the tallest if you're presidents, one. so you know, there's that. Oh, well. Okay, I think a you resident have some tall bias. guy. No, 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 no. This is why we bring in the expert opinion, <laughs> Eric, Eric. Come on, let's. That's good to know. He was a very tall man. Wasn't um, he like six three, which is pretty much yeah. a literal giant for those days? Well, and it's funny they say that because he kind of set the precedent for height too. Because a lot of future presidents, physically, they measure them up to how tall Washington was mm-hmm. to. As a standard. So, so is there like, true. is there one of those like uh, height charts in the White House, like you have in your house for your kids, and they just they have a mark, they have a market like on a 
like at the door, the door frame. The problem is way up there with James with Madison, the, like at the doorknob. With the people that we're nominating now, you're going to see like okay, uh, Donald Trump 2016, and then like if he gets elected in 2020, it'll be like an inch shorter in 2020. Yeah. As these octogenarian yeah. presidents get in, they get shorter as time goes on. That's very true. Uh, All right, so that's the two. Uh, what's our second least? I, I think it's the ten. Um, you think the 10, not the 50? Because that's what I was thinking. The, was 50, the 50 is... I think the 50's value gives it more precedence than the 10. Agreed. I just don't... I don't see a lot of 50s in my life. So I guess that's why I value oh. them so highly. <laughs> no, I know. But... Um, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't value a okay. 10. It's just I don't see them that often. You get them when, like, they run out of fives. Which apparently okay. happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do the 10 then. Um, Cameron, why don't you start us off? Uh, for the 10, this is my yep. dark horse. So I thought, I thought long and hard about this, and I wanted to kind of shake things up. You know, I'm a, I'm a guest in the, on the podcast. This is me shaking it up. Okay, I'm excited. Um, the Supreme Court is... Um, All of them? No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> I'm setting this up. That's a, oh, Stick with okay. me here. So the Supreme Court is is a huge arm of the federal government that is the, the branch of the federal government that it just doesn't get enough attention and discussion um, that, it, that it probably mm-hmm. should. I think and, they prefer it that way. Right. And I think, but, but the importance is there. And, you know, when, I, when you look back, and I actually had to Google some of the, um, you know, Supreme Court ju- justices, um, and one that came up in my, you know, multiple minutes of research was John Marshall. So this is the okay. this is the judicial review guy. Okay, so yeah, especially in this world in which we're living, you know, some of these decrees and governors and local um, mayors and that kind of thing are saying some some pretty scary things that. I'm using my authority to make you do whatever, you know, be that a curfew or masks or whatever. John Marshall kind of championed that judicial review. Um, was he was he during Madison, uh, Marbury versus Madison? Exactly. Yeah. So he was, was his chief big case? Du- justice during that time. Yeah. And, you know, this is still a conversation that we're having um, 200 plus years later, and it still rings true. Um the fact that yeah that the constitution is the law of the land and it needs to be respected and adhered to as opposed to eh, i'm going to make this change willy-nilly yeah well and and kind of like what eric did with washington you know washington was the first washington set the precedent for the executive john marshall was that for the judicial branch right. i mean marbury versus madison was the first real test of the supreme court and um had it gone differently the way we used the supreme court would be very very different today um so yeah that's a that's a good one cameron uh eric what about you so this is my other reuse so everyone from here on out is new guys for me um just because i I look at some of these figures and i say this this person needs to be remembered for what they did um but again they can get pushed to a place that i think is is less out in front and I think he's actually more out in front in this one, but it's Thomas Jefferson. Um, again, a person who, who did own slaves, had his faults, but he wrote, he authored the Declaration of Independence. He authored um, these documents that have shaped um, shaped the way that we we have this country. Um, you know, he was a third president. He did the Louisiana Purchase, which was illegal. Um, he set up the Lewis and Clark expedition. He was this person who had a high interest in all these explorations and discoveries. Um, he did actually, uh, was part of the abolition of the importation of slaves. So while that's not abolishing slavery completely, it's, um, it's definitely a step forward. And again, uh, he had this idea that, that slavery was harmful to both slave and master. Um, which again, he still owned slaves and, and he, like we talked about a few episodes ago was kind of that, had that aim of gradual emancipation. We're going to do this slowly. It will be less harmful that way. Um, but he also, there's no single person who really 
identified individual rights and freedom as highly as he did. And it's, I mean, that thing, that thread throughout American history is kind of kept this nation on a certain path. Yeah, I, I think, and I didn't keep any, but if I was to keep two, it was going to be Jefferson and Washington um, because their influence on the country is just, uh, I don't know if anybody had more impact on the way the nation um, started and developed um, than those two. Uh, but for my 10, I went with Ike, Dwight D. Eisenhower, um, general during World War II, uh, Operation Overlord, led the uh, Allies to victory, and um, was elected to two terms in the 50s, um, from 1952 to 60, oversaw the end of the Korean War. Um, he was just a, kind of a larger-than-life guy, and I think... If you're going to have somebody replace anyone uh, on the on the currency, you got to have someone that's huge, and and that's that's Ike. I mean, he just there was you know I like I there's nobody that really could hold a candle to him uh, during his time in in the United States kind of theater uh, in in the spotlight. Um, he also created the inter- interstate highway system. Um, he did do civil rights legislation supporting that, black voters. So, so both but, of those, both of those are very American things, aren't they? What civil rights the and the American highway system? Yeah, yeah, and we treat both of them about the same now, um, underfunded and not maintained very well. <laughs> I was, I was but, curious um, about what you meant. Yeah, so I, I think um, it, just his impact in, in American culture and, and leading us out of World War II. I mean, I know Truman was there. Um, but into the 50s and and uh, during kind of the initial height of the Cold War. I mean, without his leadership there, you know, and you have a, a less steady um, hand at the wheel with him negotiating with Stalin and then um, Khrushchev, I think uh, he doesn't get a lot of the due that he deserves as a president. Um yeah, I mean, he's one because of these Because everyone's guys, so enamored with how he was as a general. Yeah, he, he's similar to Ulysses S. Grant in that respect, in that he was this very famous war general who did these great deeds in this epic war, then ends up as president. I think Grant wasn't a great president, but, but Eisenhower was much steadier, like you said, as yeah. president. Yeah, and, and, and he had a couple of, I guess... Uh, marks on his presidency you know he didn't really enforce the desegregation of schools even though that was in brown versus the board of education that ruling came down um he he did a little bit but not he didn't really do forced integration and then he also um had a operation wetback which was a mass deportation of immigrants to mexico 1.3 million were deported back to mexico That was literally the name of it. Yeah, I'm not wow. trying to be pejorative. It's what they that's, called it. Um, that's so amazing. I, I, and, and I <laughs> that's know amazing depend- that they would name it that. Yeah, and and I know. I guess depending on who you are, you have a different view on immigration. But I, I think that's gone down as one of the not highlights of his administration, um, as seen by the country today as a whole. Uh, but overall, I, I think he is deserving. I mean, he, he, what is he on the 50 cent piece now? No, or, it's Kennedy. Or is he on the dollar, the dollar piece? Who? But Eisenhower? Yeah. He's not on anything. I know he used to be. He used to be on the dollar coin. Oh. Um, but I think he deserves. I can respect that. I can respect that. Yeah. All right. Um, so we've done the two, the 10. What do you think is next? Uh, I would. I would say the 50 then. If okay. not for the 10, I would say the 50. Well, let's let's go to the 50. Because I think the right. 1, the 5, and the 20, and the 100 are the big big boys. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll go. Okay. Uh, I had James Garfield. So <laughs> not the cat. Um, but he was the president in the 1880s. Uh, he actually only had a six-month term. He was assassinated within the first year of being president um but he was a general in the civil war he was from ohio let me pull up his his kind of 
his uh, highlights. Uh, elected to the Ohio Senate in 1859, fought in the Civil War, rose to Major General, led the Union to victory at Paintsburg, fought in the Battle of Shiloh, um, was elected to Congress in 1862, elected the US, U.S. Senate in 1880, and then he went to the Re National Committee, or Republican National Convention in 1880, to campaign for John Sherman, but the speech he gave was so good that all the delegates there said, no, we want Garfield. That's who we want to be our nominee. So the guy he went campaigning for didn't get the nomination, and Garfield said got it and then went on to win the presidency. Um, Do you think that that's possible in this coming election, by the way? I hmm. think the parties have eliminated the possibility of that. I, I know really? we like to float the specter of a contested convention. What um, if? <laughs> yeah. I mean... And, and not to jump into current events, because I know that's not really our game, but in in January, when Joe Biden had basically locked up the Democratic nomination, we didn't have coronavirus. We didn't have riots in the streets. We didn't have looting. We didn't have an independent nation spring up from the ashes of Seattle. Um, Which we all knew was going to happen eventually anyway. Eventually. I mean, that's, just, that's just Seattle. So eventually, um, it, you know, things can change and they've changed pretty quickly. Uh, I, I don't know. I wonder if that's possible. I don't know. If, well, never mind. I'm just not going to get into that right now. No, I, I, I didn't know I that. Think that in general, I, I think in the general idea is that the way conventions are structured today in the whole nomination process is that um, conventions are essentially a formality and a celebration, not an actual decision-making time or process. That's all been done by the time the convention is yeah. rolled around. Um, you know, he did push for civil reform in government. He kind of went against the spoils system that was established during Jackson's presidency where the, to the victor goes the spoils. Um, he pushed for universal education. Um, he did this as a means to help African Americans advance. He was a abolitionist. Um, he appointed Frederick Douglass to recorder of deeds and other black Americans to government posts. Um, pushed for free trade and treaties around the world, including Korea, Madagascar, uh, much of Central and South America. Um, his the, the big, um, I guess, knock on him is that he was um, accused of accepting bribes in the credit mobilier scandal of 1872. Uh, which is a railroad scandal involving the Union Pacific and the Transcontinental Railroad. But um, that's pretty much it. I, I think he was think shot. Great. He was shot with a four four two caliber. Yeah, like and he that's didn't a die. that's a big bullet. He was shot in July and he died September nineteenth. So he, he oh my gosh was on his deathbed for three months. Um, as president and uh, well would they I mean the vice president I assume kind of took over at that point yeah but um, mm. I mean he still was technically president until he died so yeah. um, and he wasn't like unconscious the whole time I mean he was still I think trying to do what he could um, and there was a chance where they thought he was going to get better but I think sepsis set in and, and that's what finally did it but um, yeah I just think he was a kind of a an unknown that uh even though he didn't have a long term as president, he did have a um, kind of a, a really important impact in the post Civil War era. Interesting. All right, Cameron, who you got for the fifty? Uh, for the fifty, Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy. Teddy Roosevelt. Um, you know, he's literally a Mount Rushmore guy. Um, yeah. I read that he was the, the youngest president, which I didn't know that. Is Mount Rushmore um, still there? Do they tear that down yet? <laughs> oh, Eric is on a roll tonight. <laughs> Just tell um, him to try to set it on fire. <laughs> yeah. Um I, I, I just think it's it's cool. You know, he's a he's a man's man. He he grew up you know, really as a sickly kid, he had super severe asthma mm -hmm. and pretty much worked him his way into being a rough rider. And he was a conservationist and, um, you know, nature lover, that kind of thing. Um, his, I, I, I think that in any era he could have been president and, and 
garnered the respect of of the people and the voting populace and and everything just because of of who he was um and and who, who's a teddy roosevelt of today who do we do we have that kind of person around today that can, who like fought in a war and like climbs mountains and like hunts moose or elk Jesse oh, that's Joe Ventura. Rogan. No, he's not. Jesse Ventura. <laughs> I know he's not. In, uh... Well, I mean, he was a Navy SEAL, and he was—he was, you know, he rough, was governor. tough guy. So, who's that? Jesse Ventura. Oh, okay, Jesse Ventura. Yeah. I thought you said someone else. Yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe. I think a lot of people like to think that they're the next Teddy Roosevelt, but I, I don't know if we'll ever have another Teddy. Um, yeah. He was singular in, in kind of who he was as a man, and I think. Um, you know, he's the, he's the standard for manliness, you know, sort of thing. But if he's the standard, then uh, there's not a lot of us reaching it because the guy was shot during a campaign rally and continued to give the speech. Um, so I, I mean, our current president is having a hard time drinking his water and no, no, Teddy he, took, took he a got bullet that to glass the chest. down. No, he one did. hand. You're right. He got the, <laughs> he did. He, he did. didn't need two hands, you know, and, and our Democratic nominee is falling asleep on TV interviews. So I don't know if there's ever going to be another Teddy. Um, I do think as far as outdoorsman oh goes, I, I think um, George W. Bush is very, uh, very much an outdoorsman, loves staying fit. Mm-hmm. and uh, But even him, his person, nothing about his personality is Teddy-like. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I don't know if we'll ever have another I mean, one Dick like Cheney that. shot somebody else on Hunt, so... <laughs> that counts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? I'm gonna scratch who I had for the hundred and put Cheney in now, now that you mention it. Yeah, and I think too, um, you know, as a as a history novice like myself, there's three or four Teddy Roosevelt quotes that you know I think the average person could quote, and they're one liners. Mm-hmm. Um, they may not be super eloquent or beautiful or whatever, but they make a lot of sense, and they're just truisms, um, yeah. which I think are cool. I, I agree, and I I had Teddy. He's on a different um, denomination, but uh, I did have him as well. And, and it was his quotes that just are like, "This is a great man." Um, you know, he talked about the Grand Canyon. And he goes, uh, "The Grand Canyon has a natural wonder, and which is absolutely unparalleled throughout the world." Um, and then he ends it with basically saying. I will hope you will not have a building of any kind, not a summer cottage, a hotel, or anything else to mar the wonderful grandeur, sublimity, <clears throat> sublimity, and great loneliness, and the beauty of the canyon. Leave it as it is. You cannot improve it. The ages have been at work at it, and man can only mar it. Like, wow. I mean, I mean as blusterous as he was, he he truly had a love um, for nature and and for the earth, and and um, you know, it it kind of shows an, another side of him that I think we often overlook. Um, it's a good pick. Eric, who'd you have for the 50? So this is my, uh, I think it's my only non-president. <clears throat> and I'm going to put Hiram Revels on the $50 bill. Who? Hiram Revels. He's the first elected black congressman. And uh, he's elected by the Mississippi State Legislature uh, to fill the vacancy Um of Albert Brown, who was a secessionist. And so he is, um, he basically becomes the first black congressman. He's, he's a senator um, from Mississippi, but he was born in North Carolina. He's born to, to free parents. Uh, his mom is actually Scottish, but he's of Croatan and African descent. Uh, and he's an African Methodist Episcopal um, minister. And before or during the Civil War, he recruited two regiments of African-Americans from Maryland to serve during the war. Um, But I think he's just he's a notable person. Um, When we look at different, you know, I I, I wanted George Washington. He's the first president. I think having this first African-American congressman is a good point of discussion to put on a bill to say, here is this person. Here's what they did. And he actually opposed a lot of the punitive measures against um, those who had who had sworn loyalty to the Confederacy. Um, he wanted them to just be able to say their their loyalty back to the Union and be brought back in with their full rights. Whereas some of the the radical 
um, Reconstructionists were just saying, no, uh, we're going to punish them for as long as possible for what they did. So he, mm -hmm. he wanted to be moderate, um, and he looked to mend the wounds in the South as much as possible. And he saw himself as a representative not of a particular race in Mississippi, but of all uh, Mississippians. So I thought, you know, it's a good historical point to put him on that bill. Um, you know, obviously we've thought about like Harriet Tubman and I think Frederick Douglass would be great, but they're, they don't hold that federal uh, official position Government and Hiram Rebels yeah. did. So he's one that I, I, I thought of and said, this is somebody who needs to be put in a prominent position uh, on our currency. No, yeah, I, and I, 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 speaking as the, the regular man in this whole discussion is I didn't know who that was um, coming into this conversation. I mean, I, I've never heard that name in my life. And to me, that's kind of sad um, mm -hmm. that I haven't. So, again, well, getting well, you know, on I, currency I, would be great. I, I think you make a good point. But at the same time, if we're talking about, um, you know, every... Well, it's every two years we're at we're we're electing one third of the Senate, and we've been doing that for over two hundred years. I mean, there's a lot of firsts that we probably don't know. There's probably the first Jewish um, congressman, probably the first Catholic congressman, probably the first atheist congressman. Like, there's a lot of firsts. Probably first Asian American, first uh, Latino or Hispanic American, the first maybe foreign born congressman. There's a lot of firsts, and we don't know them all. And here, Marvels is kind of a more famous one, but I mean, can you name the two senators What's right it? now? Me? Anyone? I mean, who can name their senators right now? I think mine are Diane Feinstein and Kamala Harris or something. So, <laughs> yeah, never mind. But you know, it's it's. I, I get what you're saying, but yeah. I think. He, it is significant, especially since it was right after the Civil War, and right. that uh, um, after a hundred years after that, there was no um, no senator, black senators elected in the South for like another century and a half because of Jim Crow laws and, and yeah. kind of all that stuff. So it is significant, and I think it is important is that you know he was there and and he did have an impact on on the country. Yeah. All right, starting up with our next one is, um, what do you want to do? Hit the five? We got five, Would 20, that be your... the one, and the hundred. Yeah, I think five is probably the best. Okay, let's I start with the five. I didn't, oh, so um, I'll just I'll just go. I didn't get a lot, I didn't put a lot of detail, details down on the five. Okay. And, um, you know, I'm just not even considering coinage right now, but I think um, this is where I put John F. Kennedy. Um, I believe that he was kind of the leader that, that we needed at the time. Um, and there, there's so much, I, I think maybe, and I, and I, this could be my issue is that I, I base so much on the three years of his presidency and it's hard or the, I guess two and a half, it's hard to not look past the potential of eight years of his presidency and what Kennedy could have done in uniting this nation and kind of leading us through those early to mid sixties. Um, we know that his position on this, on the Vietnam war was, was a softer one and it, and it kind of got hardened um, in his dealing with the joint chiefs of staff and, <clears throat> and things that were, that were outside of his direct control. Um, he got us through the Cuban missile crisis. He, he dealt with that. Um, you know, in an extraordinary fashion. Um, and he had a lot of flaws to his character as well. But I think had he been president for eight years, I think his reputation would have been lessened quite a bit. Because I think as you continue to lead, there are more and more opportunities for you to fall short, uh, to, you know, not get the result that you know is going to be great, and, and for your faults to kind of come to light and bring you down. So, um, I, I still think he's he's really up there as one of the greatest presidents we've had, um, and and I I guess part of me wishes we had some youthfulness back in the White House. Um, so yeah, put John F. Kennedy on the five. 
That's a good one. I think it's I. I didn't put him on any of my currency, and I thought about that for a while just because he's so he had such a short tenure as a as a president, and you know it definitely was not all sterling. I mean, he his initial meeting with Khrushchev did not go well, and some say that precipitated the Cuban Missile Crisis. But he did see us through that. Um, he he was a a war hero, and his pro what was it profiles and courage was the book he wrote and um i don't know the name of it but yeah i mean yeah his actions then, during the war and he was a u.s senator he was the first tv president which that's some true. think is a big part of why he got elected is that i, I um, think he was the, the first, first catholic televised president debate. too right he was the first catholic president yeah um so yeah uh yeah he was a just a dynamic man but he was kind of that first irish catholic not italian catholic though they're still waiting for their time. Yeah. Good to, good to know. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Cameron, who'd you have? Um, so, so for our $5 bill, um, Lincoln. And I'm not changing a thing there. Um, you know, as I, as I made my notes for this, I, I've got notes for all of the other presidents. Lincoln, I don't. Just because of, of you can't defend who he it. is and that's why and and <laughs> who he was i mean the fact that you guys devoted an entire episode to him um history remembers him and he, i know you guys covered this but um him history remembers him as a great man but it's not that simple um he did what he had to do and he was probably the best leader at that time mm-hmm. for our nation but you know he preserved the union and that was his, his greatest um, achievement above and beyond, you know, at the cost slavery. of the Republic. Right. He's just, don't listen to him, Cameron. He's just being, <laughs> but, but no. And I, I, I realized that he, he kind of strong armed it and that, that comma was meant, meant tongue in cheek, but yeah, he strong armed it too. Um, so it's, it's, he's a complicated person and did a lot of good things and, he's clearly a name speaks for itself. Yeah, I, I agree. I think Lincoln is, I mean, he's just, uh, he's another one of those larger than life presidents. Um, like I said, I don't know if if there's ever going to be another Teddy. I don't think there's ever going to be another Lincoln. Um, as far as who he was as a person. Uh, so yeah, I can, I can totally see why you, you would keep him and, and I think keeping him on the five is interesting, but, um, you know, and not moving him to a different denomination, but uh, yeah, he's up there. Uh, for me, I went with James Madison. Don't you know if you ever heard of him? Uh, a couple of towns are named after him, but uh, <laughs> he was our fourth president. Um, and uh, the the but even before he was president, his impact on the country was he was a chief author of the Constitution. Um, The framework we have is largely in part because of James Madison. He came up with the Virginia Plan, which kind of established the bicameral Congress and uh, the three branches of government. Eventually that was compromised with, I think, the the main plan. But um, he also pushed for the Bill of Rights and introduced that into the Constitutional Convention because he wanted individual rights specifically called out in our Constitution and not just assumed. So his impact on on the framing of the government is huge. As president, he took over after Jefferson left. He oversaw the United States in the War of 1812, um, which can see be seen both as a good thing and a bad thing. Good because the U.S. won. They defeated the British bad. Uh, Washington burned down to the ground. Um, on Madison's Canadians. watch. Yeah. Yeah, Dolly Madison. They had to flee the White House as is British the, troops were... Why they- they built the replica in Madison. Yeah, and it's better than the one in Washington, <laughs> actually. But um, not taller. No. So, but they the White House was burned down. Um, Dolly Madison had to steal, like not take steal, but take a bunch of paintings out of the White House as uh, British troops were marching into Washington. Um, so he he oversaw that. Uh, his presidency was called the beginning of the era of good times or good feelings um, because it. Uh, led to the end of the Federalist Party. Um, He defeated them as a national organization. So he just kind of, 
you, you kind of lose him in the mix between Jefferson and Jackson because they're these dynamic people and personalities. Um, but his understated and and kind of like his presidency, um, personally he was you know very slight man. Um, He's always, uh, some say he might have been a hypochondriac. Uh, he was very small, short of stature. Not someone, you know, when we talk about Washington, six foot three and a war hero. And then you have James Madison who's just this guy. But he's this guy that set up the, the, the foundation of how our country functions. So I, I think that's where he should get his credit is, is not so much that he did all these great things as a war hero or that he uh, had this huge personality like Roosevelt, but that without maybe even realizing it at the time, he was probably one of the most important founding fathers we've had. And I take your silence as agreement that I am absolutely I'm, right with my pick. So I, I think he, uh, he definitely fits that mold of kind of an underappreciated founding father between, you know, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, these, these like, lions of this new republic um and he kind of doing the yeoman's work of of making sure these details get taken care of like the bill of rights so yeah Mm -hmm. that's a good pick all right what are we moving on to the 20 or the 100 or the one we said we saved the 20 for last right that's what we said we could we could it's up (laughs) there all right. I'd, I'd well, say let's uh, go with the 100. All right, let's do the 100. Uh, I had uh, Thurgood Marshall. And uh, I kind of picked him. You know, Cameron went with... Uh, with um, You went with John Marshall, right? John Marshall, yeah. Yeah, as your Supreme Court guy. And I went with Thurgood. He was the first African-American elected to the Supreme Court. Here's a fun fact that I just thought was so cool. He has... And let me make sure I'm, I'm not missing it. He argued 32 cases before the Supreme Court, which is a record. He won 29 of them, um, which is also a record. Hmm. Nobody has ever argued or won more cases before the Supreme Court than Thurgood Marshall. This was when he was an attorney, um, before he became a a justice. And then they Uh, just put him on the court. And they say, you're too good. Yeah, we can't keep losing to you. So, um, (laughs) But he was the lawyer when he was an attorney. He was the lawyer that argued Brown versus the Board of Education, which... Uh, struck down segregation in schools and uh, got rid of the separate but equal doctrine. He uh, was appointed to the Court of Appeals in 1961, Solicitor General in 65, and then Supreme Court in 67. He and, and the arguing cases before him, the Supreme Court, and I say this because I remember in the election, Ted Cruz's campaign, Ted Cruz had argued before the Supreme Court quite a bit as well uh, when he was an attorney general. Ted Cruz went to the Supreme Court nine times and won five of them. So to give you a comparison of just how, like, he's the goat of guys arguing before Supreme Courts. Like, he's just, there's nobody that can even hold a candle to him in terms of his his uh, ability as a solicitor, I guess. Um, as a Supreme Court justice, he ruled uh, on the landmark Road versus Wade Roe versus Wade case. Again, this is one where if you look at it in two different ways, you can say, well, that was a great thing or that was a terrible thing um, because that's the one that legalized abortion and and maybe in a more specific sense said states couldn't make laws against abortion. Um, He did push for affirmative action and the expansion of civil rights. And one of his quotes is, um, we cannot play ostrich. Democracy cannot flourish amid fear. Liberty cannot bloom amid hate. Justice cannot take root amid rage, which I think is a good advice for us today. Um, but yeah, I really like Thurgood Marshall. I think he's another one of those kind of lions that gets overlooked um, because there's so many other big personalities out there. But he was really, really important. And I think he was justice until 1991. Um when Clarence Thurgood, Thomas was nominated. Thurgood is just a great name. It's a great name. Yeah. Yeah. And Hiram, that was another great name. That was another one with just a good name that you had there, Hoffman. So a big part of how I pick people is, is based on if they have good names. <laughs> good. So, 
Yeah. Um, so you put Thurgood Marshall on the 100. Yeah. And, and here's why. And this is another part of the way I did this is Benjamin Franklin's on the 100, and he was never president, but he was really, really important. And uh, so that's kind of why I went with Thurgood, is that he's never been president, but he was a very important justice uh, for the United States. Um, how about you, Cameron? Um, we're on the 100 now. And I think that, that Reagan, the fact that um, he isn't on there kind of surprises me, um, honestly. That he's pretty much known as the, the conservative champion. And um, mm-hmm. this is a, it's kind of a dangerous thing. But, you know, there's a lot of talk nowadays of, of, Trent, of Trump. And is he really a Christian? And, you know, him pandering with the Bible and holding that up and everything. Um, I don't profess to know Reagan or Trump or anybody and don't mean to question their faith or anything, but I, I think he wore his faith on his sleeve more than most presidents. Um, and, and that was just obvious to, to me and, and to, to many people. He's from the, mm-hmm. the great state of California as well. And um, it went, when Hollywood spoke, too, right? exactly exactly but but when he spoke and and you know i was i was a kid when he was president he looked into the camera and you really understood him you really felt he he was talking just to you um yeah through that screen so did and, he get um, your vote in 1984 cameron <laughs> landslide yeah i mean all the laymans so you, you voted for him <laughs> obviously <Twice. laughs> yeah. um but yeah, you know, it, when you start to, to put together his body of work, I mean, the assassination attempt, he, he survived that um, during a very difficult time in American history, too. You know, you, you think about the war on drugs and the Cold War and all the work that he did with, um, you know, tearing down the, the Berlin Wall. Those are things that are, are mm-hmm. hugely, hugely um, uh, just, just hold historical weight. Well, and he's also in to show how popular he was at the time in his reelection campaign. He won forty nine of the fifty states. The only state he didn't win was Minnesota, which was his opponent was from Minnesota. Right. Uh, who's, who's the opponent? I can't remember his name. No. Geraldine Ferraro was the VP. Walter Mondale, yeah, Walter Mondale was the one was was from Minnesota. So I mean, yeah, he was. Maybe some people don't are a little soft on Reagan now. Um, you know, as time has gone on, but in the eighties, man, he was, he was the guy and, um, the country as a whole loved him. So, and no other president since has even gotten close to his electoral, um, victory in, in the 84 election. Wonder what the, the popular vote though was, uh, in those, but yeah. So, um, so you're up, Eric. <clears> the <throat> hundred. Um, I I give this kind of my highest value, and I guess if we said the twenty was more valuable, or the one was more valuable than the hundred, I Calvin Coolidge, Silent Cal. And, Silent Cal uh, made your hundred. Yeah, I mean, okay. So I'm really curious. Um, you know. He, first of all, he became president when Warren G. Harding died. And then um, he kind of like brought some stability and confidence back to the White House because Warren G. Harding Harding had had a numerous, uh, you know, all these different scandals. And so Calvin Coolidge kind of put those away and said, no, we're not doing that. Um, He won every northern state in his 1924 election except Wisconsin. Ooh, sorry about that. Which is suspect. And I'll talk to him. So I mean, he was—he was like a middle-class guy. He was a regular guy. Everyone kind of uh, saw him. Um, there's this quote here. It says he embodied the spirit and hopes of the middle class. That he did represent the genius of the average is the most convincing proof of his strength. Um, he lost a son while he was at the White House. His son uh, got a blister and got blood poisoning. He was on the tennis courts of the White House, and he died like a week later or two weeks later. Um, he was very anti-regulation. Thin to the point of invisibility, I read. 
Um, but that's not the case. When he was a governor of Massachusetts, he actually helped push through a lot of regulation. And that's not necessarily that he was anti-regulation. He just thought it belonged at the state level. Um, he did not seek a second elected term, though. And they approached him as as the, that of wanting him to run in 1927. He said no. Uh, he had him back off. Um, he refused him. So, and that was um, Herbert Hoover was in office, and they wanted him. Uh, they wanted Calvin to push Herbert Hoover out at the convention, and he just resisted that. Um, you know that name, Silent Cal. There's a few quotes here. Uh, he was silent in five languages. <laughs> yeah. Wow, uh, fluently silent in five languages. And, uh, you know, you probably heard this one where he was at a party and a woman said, I made a bet today that I could get more than two words out of you. And he said, you lose. You lose. The only two um, words he said. Yeah. And, and then, you know, he, he was like, he was just kind of a down to earth guy. So he wasn't in, big into the parties. He wasn't big into the fashionable scene. But people would, he would end up at all these parties. His wife was pretty... Uh, you know, she liked to be out on the town. And so somebody asked, like, if you just sit around and don't talk, why do you come here? And he basically said, you got to eat somewhere. Um, and here's the quote of his. I feel uh, like you're, no, I think, I feel like you're putting the Eric Hoffman of presidents on the hundred right now is what you're doing. (laughs) You're you're saying, I don't like parties. I don't like all this high fashion stuff, but I got to eat. So I guess I'll go. That's it. Is there anything wrong with that? No, like, I'm who's just, really complaining? I, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to put my face on the hundred then. Um, no, I know. No, Reagan is so. Cameron. I mean, that makes sense. Hollywood, <laughs> man of the people. Hollywood. I guess uh, I'm a civil rights attorney in Thurgood Marshall, which yeah. I, I don't know if that's accurate, but no, yeah. that's what I see on your Twitter yeah. account. Um, <laughs> so here's the quote that I think is most pertinent today, and it's this: He said, "The words of a president have an enormous weight and ought not to be used indiscriminately." Well, that's a. a good I mean, had Calvin a lot of people had Calvin Coolidge had a Twitter account, he just never would have used it. I mean, it would have been great. It. He might have liked a few things, but he would never actually so said anything. There's a couple other things. Uh, he he um, he told uh, in his State of the Union address that civil rights of African Americans are just as sacred as those of any other citizen. We have a private duty. Uh, we have a public and private duty to protect those rights. He granted U.S. citizenship to all Native Americans on reservations at the time. Um. He was only 60 when he died in 1933. Um, So I I just see a lot of these things out of him that are like, this guy was a good man. And he he fought for rights. And but he was also just kind of like, listen, the economy, things are going to take care of themselves. I don't need to butt my head in everywhere. And here's my favorite story of Calvin Coolidge. And it has to do with something called the Coolidge effect, um, which you can look up on your own. But here's the story. So there's this joke, basically he was president. He and his wife, um, Mrs. Coolidge are being shown around this experimental government farm and they're, they're separate. So he's following one guy, she's following another or whatever. And so Mrs. Coolidge comes to the chicken yard. She noticed that the rooster was mating very frequently. And, uh, she asked the attendant how often that happened and was told dozens of times each day, Mrs. Coolidge says, Tell that to the president when he comes by. <laughs> so then Calvin Coolidge comes by and they tell him that. And he's, he asks, same hand every time? And the, <laughs> oh, no, Mr. President, a different hand every time. And the president said, tell that to Mrs. Coolidge. <laughs> <laughs> and I just... That's awesome. I, I just feel like he's the kind of guy... You could sit in your backyard and just chat with, and he wouldn't have a ton to say, but you'd just be at ease around him. Um, so he should be He's on got that kind of uh, laconic humor. Yeah. Very understated, but really funny. Yeah. All right. That's good. Um, uh, let's move on to the one. And right. um, I guess I'll, I'll start off and, and here's where I, I guess if, if, it wasn't a stated rule, but you didn't pick anybody that was still alive. And and in this case I did, Uh, I did pick Barack Obama and I put him on the one and I picked him because he is the first black president. And just like Washington was the first American president. Uh, I do think the significance isn't American. 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got me. You got me. That's going to get cut and edited over so and over Jake again. Jake is a birther. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. Rewind 15 seconds. Cut that. Fix it in post. Um, oh. But while Washington was our first president, uh, Obama is our first black president. And I think whether or not you agree with his presidency, um, the impact and the significance of that is huge. And while maybe he shouldn't be put on money now, while while he is still alive, I, I kind of do agree with your sentiment on that where we, and I didn't think about it that way, but um, we shouldn't, um, I do think eventually he is going to get put on some currency. And I think deservedly so. Uh, before he was president, he was senator. Um, uh, from the great state, I guess, of Illinois. Although my personal feelings on Illinois tend to cloud that. Um, and in office, and again, you can look at a lot of these people and you can look at their record and say, well, I don't like what he did here or there. But they're, whether or not you like what they did, they are significant and they did have a big um, impact on the U.S. And I you think... Know, I, I think, and I think it's interesting that while we're when we're in a presidency or when we're in the term after a presidency... We're, we're still very harsh on that. We're either very high or very low on that particular president. As, yeah. as time goes on, it softens until you get to a point in time where you're, you're like a generation or two away that we can mm-hmm. actually judge fairly a presidency. So right now, I think we still judge Obama's presidency pretty harshly because we're in the term right after it ended. Mm-hmm. But we judge George W. Bush a little bit more. more we judge it softer. Um, yeah. And... It won't soften over time. It will become more fair over time. So, yeah, and I, I think that's a, a good way of looking at it. And it, so, like I said, whether or not you agree with what he did, he did do some big things. Uh, Obamacare is obviously what he hitched his wagon to, and and in general, I would say that was a, a failure. Um, but it was a significant piece of legislation, and whether or not Obamacare survives in a form that we know it as it has fundamentally shaped how we view uh, health care and, and health insurance in the United States. Uh, similarly, he did the executive order for DACA, which was actually recently just upheld uh, by the Supreme Court this week, um, really pushed for a lot of multinational trade agreements, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, free trade with the U.S. and Colombia, um, South um, and South America. He put us in the Paris Climate Accord, which I know Trump pulled out of, but um, the U.S. was instrumental in kind of negotiating that. And I, I would say his biggest accomplishment, and again, I don't agree with necessarily how we got there, but he did oversee the United States getting out of the recession. And he did lead us to 70-some months of job gains and um, economic growth. Again, you can make criticisms of that, and, and say, well, wage growth didn't go up as much or these other factors. But um, he did uh, oversee the United States uh, getting out of the recession, which I, I think is a big feather in his cap. Yeah, those, those aren't those aren't bad arguments. I, I Again, my, my beef with that is not necessarily my, any disagreements with him, but by putting him on money... <clears throat> Like if you put him on the one dollar bill, that's what we're on, right? Um, yep. I mean, what if you put Trump on the one dollar bill three years from now? I mean, there's some people that will Trump take it love that. and just rip it up, and, and you could put Bush, Bush two on the dollar bill, and again, as as time goes on, it softens. Once you get to a certain point, people have removed their emotions from it. Um, so, that, no, and, and I think that's a fair criticism. Um, because I think it's just, it's tough. Like if, if you, if Trump next week said, I'm putting my face on the $1 bill, th- half this country would just start burning that. Well, they wouldn't burn their current dollar bills, but you know, if they got one, they'd ask for an exchange, you know, it'd just be, it'd be a whole other deal and, yeah. and nobody wants to deal with Give me that. a bag of nickels. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so no, I, I get it. I bet the $2 bill would get a lot more popular though. So that'd be good. That's true. With old, with old Nixon. Um, all right, uh, Cameron, who'd you have on the one? 
Um, yeah, this is another one that is just too perfect to change. Um, first president, one dollar bill. Um, Washington is the, the father of our nation. It just makes too much sense to change that. Um, I, I think the best yeah. thing about Washington, um, and, and I realize we already said it, but um, he was reluctant to be the leader. Um, he was really pushed up on stage and, you know, said, hey, the only way this is going to work is if you're our guy. Um, and as much as he hated it, he understood that he was that guy and he shouldered that burden. And, you know, that's, it's, it's Father's Day and, and all of that. As, as fathers, that's kind of our job to shoulder that burden and to, you know, take care of the kids and take care of the wife and, and all that responsibility is um, a big weight. And when you've got a brand new nation that grows up to be the greatest nation on earth that the world has ever known, um, that's, that's hard to outdo that. And it's, like I said, it's just, he's, he's the Michael Jordan of presidents. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> that's a good way of putting it. Um, yeah. And like, you know, Washington and, and I know Eric, you put him on the two, um, he's just one of those guys that it's hard not to put him on some currency um, because yeah. he's so important. And uh, with that, Eric, who'd you so, have on the one? So the one dollar bill being as as widely circulated as it is, <clears throat> and I know I keep come back to this a couple times, and I think is it's it's kind of timely is the the idea of memorializing somebody who did or participated in something abhorrent like slavery. I, I, I get it. I, I can empathize with that. Um, and so knowing that I had to put somebody on the dollar bill that, that couldn't have participated in that, but also somebody that was so immensely important to the founding of this nation. I would consider him the most important founding father. Um, and that is John Adams. He, aboard slavery. He never owned a slave in his life. Um, he assisted in the writing of the Declaration of Independence. He was a uh, minister to France um, at the beginning of the revolution to try to ex get funds from France. And he did that kind of in tandem with Benjamin Franklin and he tried to like rein in Benjamin Franklin from saying stupid things yeah. um, and, and irritating people. Um, you know, he had this amazing relationship with his wife, Abigail. He was away for like two years at a time and he took his son with him, one of his children. So he was away from his wife and, and his other children for two years. And, you know, we, we have the record that we have their letters back and forth. Um, he did, um, you know, he was also that lawyer who defended the British soldiers who fired at the Boston Massacre. So he believed in that, that right to counsel, that um, presumption of innocence. Those are things that he saw as tantamount to a new republic. They were very important. Um, so he was willing to side with the enemy to defend their innocence because it, it was worth defending. Um, and his presidency was okay. Um, he did sign the Alien and Sedition Acts, which are boo moments for me. He served one term as the second president. Uh, he was the vice president. And that was a time, you know, when his vice president was Thomas Jefferson, who was the opponent party's candidate. So if you can imagine the next election was, you know, Donald Trump wins and Joe Biden is his vice president or vice versa. Yeah, that's a reality show you want to watch. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, so totally different how they did that. But yeah, and, and I, I think John Adams... He needs to be memorialized in a way almost that 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 puts him it kind of supersedes even Washington and Jefferson. As great as they were, they were arist aristocratic and John Adams was not. <clears throat> um, and so I, I think he should be he should be kind of raised up as more of what Americans should and can be. Um, as opposed to Washington and Jefferson, who. Um, they just come from different places and different attitudes. So John Adams gets my one. That's a good one to have. 
All right. Well, that leaves us with the 20. Um, Big old want, 20. Who wants to go first? I'll, I'll get mine out of the way. I haven't right. gone first yet. Um, he's been said before, and I think being such a common currency and being used so frequently, I think it's necessary to put somebody that, somebody that people can identify with and aspire to, and that's Theodore Roosevelt. And I think he just he needs to be a face that says we this is American ingenuity. This is American uh, vibrancy and American um, willingness to step out and uh, with courage and without fear and and, and stand in, in the gap and, and just kind of go above and beyond in your own personal life. Um, and then you can aspire also to the presidency. So I think it'd be great to have him on the 20 and for people to see his face and see this is a great man and a great president. And that mustache really belongs on some money. It should. It, like the mustache, the mustache is what, yeah, just put the mustache on the 20. The mustache and the hat with the glasses, no actual face, just those three. You know, it, just put them on the horse on the 20. <laughs> like let's stop screwing around. Yeah. It shouldn't even be his presidential portrait. It should be his military attire. <laughs> I love it. Um, well, I also had Teddy, so I'm not going to belabor the point. Uh, yeah. As Cameron has been known to say, he wasted he's a man his of Teddy the people. on earlier denomination. He's a man of the people. So, uh, and I thought the 20 is the dollar of the people. Like, that's the most commonly used um, mm. denomination. It's not too pretentious. It's not 100, but it's not, it's not nothing to sneeze at either. Uh, and so that's why I put Teddy on the 20. Um, how about you, Cameron? What do you got? Lead us out. You know, it's it's funny because I don't I don't consider the twenty dollar bill as you know the man of the people or anything like that. So when I was thinking about how to assign these, um, the, I felt like Martin Luther King should have been on this list, but wasn't a politician doesn't doesn't fit the bill. Um, so I was thinking, okay, during oh that, pun intended. Ah, nice. Yeah. No, totally. Yeah, totally. We're funny. Um, so I, I was thinking of another person who, you know, came alongside him during that time period um, because that, Don't say it. that oh. era was so, so important in, you know, racial equality in this country. And I chose a lot of people from, from different backgrounds and that kind of thing. Um, if, if I can't choose Martin Luther King, I think um, RFK, Bobby Kennedy, Bobby is, is huge. So, you know. An attorney general. Yes. Huh? Two Kennedys, right? Yeah, you picked two it, Kennedys. That's bold. No, I didn't put John. I didn't no, put, I, John. I put oh, John. Eric, you had John. Okay. okay. Still, the picking, picking the attorney general over the president brother, or over the senator brother, the alcoholic senator brother. Um, it's bold. Well, well, here's why, though, too. Um, yeah, if, if you look at it, he was an attorney general. He was a senator. He ran for president. Um, and I, I realize he didn't win as, as a president. But, you know, what if? Had he not I, I, been assassinated? I think he wins that. Um, oh, yeah. If, if. Yeah, exactly. And how much would that have changed the course of history? You know, you look at the the Kennedys, they were obviously a dynasty as it is, but if to have two presidents in that in that family, um, pretty formidable. Um, yeah, and John used Bobby kind of as a man behind the scenes to get a lot of stuff done domestically. Um, so it's not out of the realm that even in, in John's uh, administration, Bobby had a very important impact on, on kind of how that, um, that how that shaped uh, how John Kennedy ran his his administration. So yeah, I, I think that's a that's kind of a sleeper pick, but it's not a bad pick. It's just it's not one that would pop into your head, especially because his brothers were so much more famous. Um, but had Bobby lived, he would have been just as, if not yeah. more so. Yeah, an attorney general, though, as that pick. And, and well, and a senator, I, I guess. So, mm -hmm. that's all right. I can, I can hang with that. Okay. 
All right, well, uh, that wraps us up. Does Cameron, it? Oh, please. yeah, you said Theodore. I, I was like waiting for Jace. I did say Ted. Teddy. Oh, I did it. Teddy, yeah. all right. I think Teddy's the only one we all picked um, in some way. But, yeah, so that wraps it up. Cameron, thank you so much for coming. I hope you had a good time. Uh, it was a blast. That was great, guys. Thanks for having me on. Hopefully we can do this again. Yeah, we yeah, will. Yeah, sure. you're, you're good at baseball and stuff, right? Like, are you the guy we talked to about baseball? Or is it basketball? <laughs> <laughs> either one i'm a man of the people right jake <laughs> <laughs> yes you are all right well that wraps up this episode of dad Bod history thank you all and have a great week